Greetings and welcome to this mini lecture uh, on a brief history of comics. And we're using this as kind of a good backdrop to get into uh, what we're looking at this week, which is horror comics in the 1950s and moral panics and censorship campaigns and kind of how all that ties into popular culture. So let's get started. So we know of comic books in today's society. They are you know, used for blockbuster videos, for TV shows, for video games, etc. Um, but if we're looking for the early, or the early origins of the uh, of comic books, there's a couple predecessors. Now, the, some of these some would call far reachers, but far far reaching. But I think they still you know speak to this idea of using images and words to static images and words to communicate uh, a narrative. So if we use that as our definition, the first real predecessor, some people have said hieroglyphics or have said uh, paintings on the walls, you know, in, in Neanderthal or in prehistoric times. But really, I would say the Bayeux Tapestry from the 11th and 12th century. Um, this is, was a 1.6 foot by 224 feet, 224 feet uh, essentially tapestry uh, and it illustrated the Norman conquest and as you can see in the image here it not only has images but it has words communicating what's going on. We also in the 1300s see the Stations of the Cross and though there are no words here we do have this you know procedural or sequential series of steps within the Stations of the Cross and so you know you move through the story you move from painting to painting sequentially and it's supposed to tell a story right and that's what we think of with comics as you move through the individual panels and it tells a story. Uh, in 1731 William Hogarth wrote A Harlot's Progress and this is essentially a woman's fall from grace uh, and it's it was in contrast to or an irony of a pilgrim's progress which is about a um it, it was a story in which a a person uh, moves up and finds you know more holier grounds whereas the harlot of course goes in the other direction and the first what we consider true comic uh, or, or really kind of emphasize, or really developed the form, or, or what we think of as the form today, uh, would be Ro uh, Rodolphe Toffler. And he had these series of stories in the 1800s that really did uh, mix, you know, static sequential images with text. Uh, everything that we looked at before, these were either paintings or stills, they were not aligned together. And it's really at the end of the 1800s that we get the Yellow Kid by Richard Felton Occult, who really changes uh, comics, and or really gives us comics. And as you can see on the right here, here's what it looked like. You know, you had people everywhere, and people were saying things, and there was print, and there was, there was a lot of action going on. And originally these were black and white single panels in the magazine Truth from 1894 uh, to 1895 but in May 1985, 1895 um, The World run by Joseph Pulitzer has uh, occult published Hogan's Alley which is essentially the same as The Yellow Kid um, and that you know that becomes extremely popular very quickly and, and before you know it publishers are fighting one another for to get capture or to hold on to comic artists because they they really do sell newspapers in the late 18 in early 1900s so later on or, or as we see we start to, we see this boom of comic artists and we see lots of different people but some people that I think are impressive or interesting or whose influence we still feel in a variety of ways today uh, Windsor McKay if you ever get a chance really check out his work we look at uh, Gertie the Dinosaur in this course which is an early animation but his comic art is fascinating there are definitely issues of race going on it, particularly in his series Tales of the Jungle Imps that should tell you right off the bat but his the the way he approaches art um, and storytelling is phenomenal. Little, little Nemo in Slumberland or Dream of a Rare Beat Fiend, he deals in these environments of sleep and kind of the crazy things that can go on there. So there's always fascinating and visually stunning things to appreciate within 
uh, McKay's work. I, you know, it's still enjoyable to read McKay's work today, and it's clear his efforts have influenced a lot of other artists, uh, both comic artists and other artists along the way. We also have uh, George Joseph Harriman, whose famous uh, work includes Crazy Cat or Crazy Cat and Ignat's Mouse, and this you know this ran for for just over 30 years and first appeared in in Hearst's uh, New England Evening Journal, and this is really the predecessor to Tom and Jerry. It's about these two cat you know about these two characters a cat and a dog a cat and a mouse and sometimes even a dog, um, but they're highly antagonistic towards each other and are continually you know fighting and often the the comics ended with um, Ignatz throwing a brick at Crazy Cat's head, uh, which again, if, if we are, if we've watched our good share of Tom and Jerry, as, as I know at least I have, uh, this is a very familiar theme of, of kind of that violence or even the mouse getting the upper hand by the end of the cartoon. So a couple things to look at in terms of early trends or trends in early comics. Um, first was that there was tech, you know, the technology was needed for mass production. Comics, need, you know, couldn't really take form until you had the technology to do it. Because think about it, where they were reproducing not just text at this point, but text and drawings, and that doesn't really, you don't see that really possible until you get into the 1800s and you start to see, you know, uh, drawings reproduced at large scale and then eventually uh, the mixture of, to of of drawings and text and that, that does take a while and it takes a while for it to become cheap enough to do it for newspapers and it takes a while for it to become you know seen as something worth investing in and of course once they invest in it they find oh my god everybody wants this and of course, you know, with comics, they are mass produced, which is, of course, makes them undervalued in the early 20th century, right? Comics, they're a fascinating thing. The comic strips, that which was published in newspapers, are undervalued, but not necessarily as vehemently as comic books will be undervalued. Comic strips almost will never have the, uh, the battles that comic books actually have. And it is interesting to know that, that comics, those comic strips that, you know, some of which I just showed you, those drove newspapers. Those, you know, those, those strips increased sales ex significantly. Uh, you see their inclusion really driving a lot of sales and a lot of people interested in getting, whether it's the Sunday or the weekly, you know, the Sundays typically were the ones with color and you'd have, you know, from four to six, pa six uh, four to 16 pages of color comics. It, it was just visually stunning and many people enjoyed it and bought newspapers just for the, for the comics. Uh, again, early comic strips were predominantly male, both in the characters that were covered as well as in the people involved in the industry. This is nothing entirely new, but we do occasionally see some females pop up here and there throughout comic strips and comic books. And as a you know, comic artists dappled in different areas or different forms. As I said, Winsor McKay he made the cart he made an early cartoon. Uh, <clears throat> Miles Goss, I, I believe that's his name. Miles Goss he he did he did comic strips, but then he also wrote what some could argue is the first graphic novel or wordless novel, in that it's all images, and basically it it pieces together an entire mel melodramatic story. When we get into the 1920s and we see the rise of pulp fiction and radio and film, uh, these all have serious impact on the development of comics in terms of the stories they tell, in terms of the ideas they offer up. Uh, they really do have a long-lasting influence on comic books as well as comic strips. The first, bi there were comics before Action Comics number one, but Action Comics number one with Superman, as you can see the cover there, was the big game changer. It comes out in 1938, and its impact is is felt very quickly. Uh, Action Comics skyrocket sales among children and adults, and are selling millions of copies in a very short time. So it's not the first comic book. It was. The, 
Action Comics was an anthology of comics. It wasn't just Superman. There was about six or seven stories within the 64-page comic, but the Superman story was written by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. It was a variety of comic. There was a Western in there. There was a sports. There was a mystery. There was, I think, Zantano, who was this, this magic person. Um, there was lots of different things going on in that comic. And it was published by National Allied Publications, which eventually becomes DC Comics. So this is Superman's first appearance, um, and there's interesting things about it. He does appear, he does, uh, he is an orphan. Um, and what's interesting is he's an orphan both from Krypton and on Earth. We're familiar with uh, Superman having Ma and Pa Kent, but in Action Comics number one, he actually is put into f he is put into a a youth home essentially. Not he isn't placed with a family. Uh, in that first in those those few pages that that first comic covers, he he fights a wife beater, he saves a person on death row, and he addresses a lobbyist trying to create a war for the United States to get involved in. So this is a fascinating comic in an, or story in and of itself because Superman fights at the local level with the wife beater, he fights at the state level with saving the person from death row, and he fights at the national level by interfering with the lobbyist. So there is a lot of weight going on in that first issue. He's not just, you know, some crime fighter that's fighting in his local town, but he's fighting a much bigger battle. Um, and of course, his tagline is Champion of the Oppressed, the physical marvel who had sworn to devote his existence to helping those in need. So it's a very fascinating character to be looking at and to have become so popular in 1938. All right, so if we're looking at comics in the, between the 1930s and the 1950s, a couple things we have to think about. Um, in terms of Superman's popularity, it's almost everywhere. So within radio, we see The Adventures of Superman, which actually introduced Jimmy Olsen and Kryptonite, and that comes out in 1940. In film serials, we see the Fleischer Superman cartoons, which I think I make reference at some... in. Uh, some of the course materials. We also see Batman serial. Uh, there's two of these come out, one in 1943 and one, t one in 1949. Uh, and there's a link there where you can check them out. Uh, in books, we see The Adventures of Superman by George Lowther in 1942. In the mainstream, the national syndication of daily and weekly comic strips in the, news, in the news, uh, newspaper. That is, Superman is syndicated in both daily and weekly comics. So if we think about what super, Superman's impact and therefore the impact of comic books as a whole, already we're seeing he's in radio, he's in film, he's in books, he's in newspapers every day across the country. Uh, he's also featured in a float in the 1940 Macy's Day Macy's, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, they declare a Superman Day on July 3rd in 1940 at the World's Fair. So Superman is clearly a very strong cultural icon, and his presence launches his presence launch, you know, comics and comics, a variety of comics in the ensuing decades. But that all comes to a head in the 1940s as horror comics take off in the late 1940s and into the 1950s. And that's a lot of what we're, we're looking at this week. And so we really we see the first indicators of concerns around comics, uh, or the first very popular, I should say, concern around comics come from Sterling North in May 1940. And you'll be reading that. Um, a na it's called A National Disgrace, and you'll, that's part of this week's reading. And so Sterling North comes out with that in 1940, and we start to see superhero comics shift from, from in the 1940s, early on, you have a lot of superhero comics, but then they shift into crime comics, and then they eventually shift into horror comics. And the concern around the content of horror comics, as you'll see in this week's documentary, uh, which is Tales from the Crypt, Volume 1, uh, from comics to television. And what you'll see is that, you know, the ways in which horror comics were being produced and the concern, you know, concerns from many different people, but most importantly, it's Dr. Frederick Wortham and his work, particularly Seduction of the Innocent, that really raise up alarms and censorship campaigns around comic books uh, in kind of the, the supposed threat that they have to author.
have to offer. And when he does that, very shortly or as a result, we have the rise of the Comics Code Authority, which essentially creates a censorship, uh, an a in industry censorship board rather than have government censor it's, uh, censor them they create their own censorship board to prevent certain comics uh, so it becomes a powerful force very early on and it, I mean it wipes out many just exist because of its existence wipes out many different publishers who can no longer publish the kind of content that they were prior to the code and one of the one of the problems with the code is that it prevents large scale exposure of complex comics. And what I mean by that is when we look at the code, and again you'll have a copy of it in this week's material, it really limits the kind of stories that can be told. And so for almost a generation, comics are infantilized. You can't tell complex stories when you have these these very strong prescribed rules about what can and can't be included. You can't include werewolves, you can't include vampires, you can't include situations in which uh, representatives of, uh, of culture such as judges or policemen are shown in some unworthy light. So there, you know, there's all sorts of limitations that these put on the form of storytelling within comics which then allows us to, or allows for generations to think oh well comics are just kitty fair they're they're not something for adults all right that's the mini lecture that hopefully gives you some sense about comics and where they come from and prepare you for the material this week thank you very much for watching see you in the next video